Hello and welcome to this very special interview. Joining us today is Chetan Ayer and uh, Helen Chial. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for uh, agreeing to speak to our viewers in times such as this, uh, Chetan. Let me start first with uh, a set of statistics, uh, you know, which have uh, come out from you over the past uh, few months. September, when we last spoke, uh, I remember you mentioned that uh, you'll, you'll probably end at 7.2% GDP growth. We went down from there to about 6.3% uh, is where you revised your target. And we are now down to 5.7%. Your last two downgrades have happened in barely a matter of a fortnight. Are we really getting seriously down the barrel? It depends upon what you say down the barrel. But I definitely think that we are in some difficult times for sure. Uh, because this is something we have not seen for 10 years. This is the kind of growth rate we are going through right now. Uh, I think it's also domestic, <coughs> but there has also been a global environment which has been going against us, and which is that we're continuously getting what we call it as triple B recovery uh, in the developed world, which we call it as uh, bumpy, below par, and brittle. So adverse global environment is the first reason, but simultaneously what we're doing domestically here, which is that we're constantly running down our saving, and at the same time there's also a decline in uh, investment, that is hurting our growth potential and bringing us all these problems that we are seeing in terms of macro symptoms in form of inflation, current account deficit, and tight interbank liquidity. So I, I would uh, broadly agree with you. I, I wouldn't use the word down the barrel, but I think this is definitely one of the most difficult times we've seen in the last 10 years. What, what, what prompted you to two downgrades in 20 days? Something must have concerned you that dramatically for you to do that. No, I think the reasons are the same two reasons, global as well as domestic. So I shouldn't, I don't, I don't think we should forget what's happening in the world as well in this period that we are going through an environment where uh, the DM is again reminding us of what they are going through. We've got the bad data out of US on Friday, but prior to that we've already been going through the European data points which have been quite adverse. Uh, what for us was mattering from uh, those global circumstances was a weak capital inflow environment at a time when we are already running very high level of current account deficit. Uh, so that is the global adversarial point. And at the same time, domestically, I think what we are realizing is that the growth is underlying slipping faster than what we were expecting earlier. Mm. So it's a combination of these two that has made us uh, bring down the growth rate so sharply. Helen, uh, data emanating from China clearly shows that there is a slowdown. Both manufacturing and non-manufacturing data is evident that way. Uh, is there reason enough for you to look at growth forecast for China? Well, I, I would say yes, uh, but I wouldn't have completely just focus on the PMIs uh, for manufacturing or non-manufacturing PMI uh, as the, uh, the, main, the most important gauge. The reason is that uh, we have already got uh, pretty much confirmation from almost all corners of the economy, uh, from every single uh, activity growth indicators, industrial production value added, IP, uh, FAI, fixed asset investment growth, and uh, also retail sales plus trade. I think that was already pretty straightforward uh, and, uh, uh, telltale signs uh, showing up that uh, the uh, Chinese economy is also slowing down very significantly. But I would put the uh, you know most of the, those reasons to domestic causes rather than external at the moment. You know, uh, there has been speculation about a possible fiscal stimulus package in China. We saw a large four trillion yuan package during the financial crisis. Markets have been ex excited on that speculation. Uh, what is the possibility of a stimulus? Um, or do you think this expectation is rather misplaced? Well, first of all, I think that policy easing is exactly what we need right now because uh, growth currently we're seeing is already below the government's you know, target, annual target of 7.5%. So they definitely have to ease the policies and provide some stimulus. So it is necessary. But second, whether they call it a stimulus package or not, I think that's largely of debate because they probably would not prefer to be called something that would remind people of the 2008 and 2009 for stimulus package, trillion stimulus package. Um, however, I wouldn't doubt the content or the quality of the policy stimulus just because of the name. Because number three, I think more importantly, I think this time the government is better prepared because they have uh, this tw uh, the 12th five-year program under which they have 21 trillion renminbi worth of uh, government-led infrastructure investment projects, out of which they can very well choose to uh, front load a lot of them to help uh, ease the, the, uh, the down downward pressures for growth not, not right now. You don't believe China is a problem at this point of time? 
Um, I wouldn't say which economy is a problem, which economy is not, but I would say that there is a lot of buffer for fiscal, monetary, and investment policy easing in China so as to help smooth the cycle. So I wouldn't say that China would particularly throw in more downside pressure for this global economy. We are going through very difficult times like India, but I wouldn't say that uh, you know, China you say is it's as a, difficult as India. Um, I, I couldn't really quantify so exactly. Is very uh, <laughs> I, I, if, I, if I can, if I can answer yeah, that sure. one, um, because uh, I think she would probably be hesitant saying that. I would definitely say that China is in a better position than India. You would say that. Okay. Uh, in terms of a policy uh, room, yes, for easing, definitely. Probably, uh, I, I would say you know, according to Chad, and we're in a better position. But and also in terms of growth, I wouldn't say we're in the worst place in the last um, ten years or so. I think we're seeing something similar as back in two thousand eight. Mm. Um, but not much worse compared to then. Chetan, just to pick up from what you've mentioned in a recent report of yours, you've called it, and we are now looking inward, you've already articulated the global issues, but you've talked about the bad growth mix has reached its limits as far as India is concerned. We believe policymakers' decision to continue the bad mix of growth since the credit crisis is at the heart of most of the macro challenges facing the country. I want you to elaborate a bit to explain that to our viewers as to what are your bigger concerns because then we come to really what the future holds. I think it's, uh, it's good to look at what was going right in 2004 to 7 and that kind of uh, puts in a good contrast versus what's happening right now. So what was happening is that we were seeing private investment going up. Uh, for a country where there is such a huge addition to the working age population, it is important to find productive jobs for them. They have income growth, they tend to save once they have the jobs, that will be used for investment and we were on a virtuous cycle. That was actually what was helping the politics as well because when your income price is growing, you distribute some money to the poor people, it works absolutely fine. Uh, and so private investment to GDP was going up, whereas fiscal deficit to GDP was going down. Since credit crisis, we have seen a complete switch in these two engines. So government has tried to lift the deficit from under 5% in March 08 to 10%, and then we've had that for now four years. And similarly, the private investment, which was at the peak of about 17%, collapsed down to about 11 and a half and has been languishing around that. We expect it to even go below 11 in March 13 financial year. So both these engines have switched and gone in the other direction. So in this mix of growth, we call it as bad growth because fiscal deficit is resulting into transfers into the hands of poor people or households, which is boosting consumption at a time where we are not laying down more capacity. And that is what is causing inflation pressures, higher current account deficit. And when you have inflation and current account deficit, you are bound to have higher interest rates, which is what we see in form of tighter interbank liquidity. Chesa, we've seen, uh, we're talking at a time when rupee is at its record lows. It's weakened quite a bit. We've seen the Reserve Bank of India announce certain measures. Many have called them piecemeal. Many also say that, you know, this is really not a problem with the Reserve Bank of India. It's been created by the government. Uh, what do you think the RBI can do and what do you think the government should be doing? To be honest, I think uh, there's not a lot that RBI can do. Uh, we've seen that they have cut policy rates by 50 basis points, but it has been difficult to translate that in form of lower cost of capital. Uh, and we think that in the current environment that we are in, what we describe now uh, this environment to be is a stagflation type of environment. Mm -hmm. Your growth rate is decelerating, but yet your inflation is not really responding and coming down quickly. Uh, in that environment, if we cut interest rates, it will still not work. For example, our deposit growth is at about 13, 13 and a half percent and credit growth is at about 17. Mm -hmm. LDR ratios are at an all time high. If I consciously try to bring down the interest rates in this environment, what is going to happen? The deposit growth will decelerate further, credit growth will accelerate further. Will the cost of capital come down? Uh, so I think it's really a difficult environment for expecting RBI to do a lot. And in this context, the comments from Delhi uh, that the cause of this slowdown is tighter monetary policy, I find it very difficult to uh, buy that point. Chetan, just a quick point again on uh you know, let's talk about <coughs> F513 now. We've got the numbers in as far as, uh, you know, your estimates are concerned, as far as F512 is concerned. Uh, you have articulated some of the concerns going forward as well. 
uh, I think your last target was 6.8% is what you were hopeful for FY13. Is that something you've revised as well or are going to revise? What, what would this year look like as far as our growth is concerned, given all these factors that you pointed out? Just to clarify on the numbers, because there's been a lot of quotation of our numbers, numbers in the media. So okay, what busy. at Morgan Stanley we try to do is to give you the calendar year and financial sure. year numbers. So since India cares for financial year numbers, for so financial 13, we are at 5.8, not 5.7. Uh, 5.7 is for the calendar year 12. And for F14, we are now we have revised it down and we are now at 6.6%. So 5.8 and 6.6 .6 is what we have is for the current year and the, the coming financial year. So still hopeful 6.6 .6 is something we'll do for this year? Yes, I think so. And uh, I think what we're basing that is on that A, the world becomes slightly better placed than where we are. Particularly in DM, we are looking for recovery in 2013. Uh, there are obviously risks to that outlook as well, but at this point of time, that's our base case. And at the same time, we are building in for some kind of a cumulative policy action here from now on over the next 12 months, which will help us achieve that higher growth rate. Uh, but again, as we highlight in that note which you're referring, we have uh, highlighted that the risks are skewed to the downside for DM as well as for India uh, on that basis. What's your sense, Helen, of what uh, can be expected from policymakers in China over the next uh, few months, given the current situation that you articulated? I think we generally are expecting policy easing in all three channels and possibly in the, the fourth one uh, to a certain extent. The first one is monetary easing. Uh, we are expecting two interest rate cuts, each by 25 basis points in the near future. Hmm. Uh, together, uh, we are also expecting the government to halt the renminbi appreciation against the dollar. Um, and, uh, and you know, com in combination with these measures, we expect a more aggressive open market operations together with, uh, um, you know, more uh, window guidance to, uh, to, to help with the funding for the investment projects. And number two, we're expecting more fiscal easing, definitely more uh, spending from the central government's perspective, as well as fiscal transfers from central governments to local governments, so that the funding for the infrastructure investment will come both from both source sources. And number three, we're expecting the, uh, the NDRC, the National Development Reform Committee, to push out more investment projects to help reboot the final demand. So all these three have to come in hand in hand, whether they call it a package or not, you know, that's probably a different question. Uh, lastly, what they can do is probably to relax gradually the implementation of the property policy tightening so far. It has been uh, ongoing for more than two years and has been implemented very rigorously. Um, um, but I think going forward, uh, we should allow us more room for uh, not only just uh, uh, first-time buyers, but also for all those that are buying for the second time or third time, the so-called improvement demand. Just a word on the inflation in China, uh, Helen. The point is that China has only now managed to pull back inflation after what a period of about two, three years. Uh, do you think Beijing will use this as an opportunity uh, to perhaps sacrifice growth in the near term so that inflation expectations can be curtailed? Well, I think inflation expectation is already much lower than before. In fact, this bout of inflation surge in the recent past just started in October 2010. So it wasn't really that long time ago. But, uh, but actually, later on, since about uh, July last year, our M2 growth has been slowing down towards 11 to 12 percent, much lower than the nominal GDP growth. In my view, this is already significant deleveraging, and that deleveraging has already been ongoing for almost 10 months. And so far, that has been very successful in terms of uh, you know, uh, uh, putting a downward pressure for inflation expectation. Uh, you, know, you can visibly see that uh, from the PPI inflation being going down for nine months already consecutively and uh, PPI inflation in negative territory for the third month uh, in a row. So I think that's already very much, you know, being there, done that, and mm -hmm. we should move on now to have more monetary easing to help with the growth front. Because after all, what matters the most for the, you know, for Beijing and for the political side is for social stability, and that comes from growth. What about the Indian inflation problem, Chetan, with especially fiscal policy, you've got a fuel price hike, you've got a weak rupee. Um, and it's very much not within the comfort zone of the Reserve Bank of India. Do you expect that to spin out of control perhaps to the 8% plus levels? Uh, yes, we are expecting it to go up to about 8% in the next two, three months, uh, primarily because of the lagged effect of the currency depreciation which we have seen. At the same time, we are seeing increased uh, food inflation pressures. Mm. Uh, so the combination of the two will take the inflation from current 7.23 to about 8% in the next two, three months. And then we should see it tapering down. 
but we are still looking for the December end number to be around uh, 7%. So we think that inflation will take a while before it comes under control. And that is why we describe this environment as stagflationary, which is that the cost of sacrifice of growth that we'll have to make will be much more than what it would have been if we started to move on the right track earlier on correcting this bad growth mix. Since we've perceived, pursued with this bad growth mix for such a long time, there will be a decent amount of cost in terms of growth sacrifice before we can bring control on inflation. Just to quote again on a key concern that you've articulated and to quote you, uh, you know, you've talked about the banking system stress remaining a key concern. And Chetan, you articulate, you say that we believe the longer duration of weak growth trend will result in a significant rise in impaired loans in the banking system, making revival in growth even more challenging. I want you to articulate a bit on that. So usually what happens in any country is that you have one or two quarters of slowdown, the banks manage to sort of, you know, juggle through their accounts and keep their liabilities, I mean, their responsibilities of servicing debt is fulfilled okay. But when you have a longer duration of growth slowdown, which in our model what we have is a GDP growth around 6% or below for six quarters now, uh, that will make it difficult for the corporate sector. And right now we are seeing some kind of technical uh, challenges where the company has not got a coal availability and that's why he's facing trouble in servicing debt. But at that point of time, once we would have passed through this four quarters, which would be approximately by March 13, uh, it would start affecting normal businesses and you would have a normal business cycle NPL, which will be quite deep. So what we now look at is because the RBI is allowing a lot of restructuring, we look at impaired loan ratio, which is restructured loans plus the gross non-performing loans. And the combined ratio we expect it to go up from current about 6.8% to roughly about 10% over the next 18 months. So there will be a big rise in the underlying non-performing loans in the system. Not all of those restructured loans will be non-performing loans, but we are, we're trying to see what is the kind of loan book which is under stress, and we think it will be about 10% over the next 18 months. And when you have that That's kind, a big number. Yeah, that's a big number. And when you have that, um, you know, evaluate that question of decline in cost of capital or cut in RBI rates, uh, how that will transmit into lower borrowing costs for the system. So first, we don't think when RBI cuts interest rates, the deposit rates will come down. When growth really comes weak, eventually the growth, deposit growth rate will come down. But banks will still be hesitant to completely pass it on because they have to recover for these non-performing loans by keeping lending rates high. And we have to allow that to happen. If we don't allow that to happen, banks will be even in a deeper trouble. So I, I just find this whole uh, scenario ensuring that it will be very difficult for the government to revive growth rate. Uh, unless we are doing something dramatic in terms of our policy changes, uh, which is, I think, what would be similar to what we did in 1991. If we don't do it, we would lose this opportunity. The consequences on India will not be as bad as it was in 1991. The consequences will be loss of growth. And in a country where you're going to add about 133 million people over the next 10 years to working age, why do we want to miss out on realizing this growth and giving this to our population? Just, just, just to uh, you know, add another point, you mentioned a little about... Uh, the impending action from RBI, while well, you've, uh, well, you've said that there is rising hope for quick monetary policy action, you don't think that that's going to happen right now, given the current situation? Well, that's a difficult one to answer because, you know, if you uh, tracked our work, we were even not arguing for the last rate cut which happened mm -hmm. uh, because we didn't believe that will get passed through in form of lower cost of capital and we still don't think it will happen. Uh, so whether, you know, the question is what they would do and what they should do, uh, I think they'll probably cut interest rates again. Uh, but the question is whether that gets transmitted. Uh, we are less optimistic on it getting transmitted. Just a question on consumption, Chetan. You know, uh, we've seen the top line of consum consumer companies fairly healthy. Uh, there is a school of thought that this consumption will continue irrespective of what's going on. The second that believes that with weak investment outlook, you're going to see this tapering off. What do you think is likely to happen in this space? I think consumption is already tapering off. I mean, we've seen this in the last quarterly GDP data, but we're also seeing it in sectoral data points, that corporate revenue growth uh, for even the consumer companies is beginning to, dis beginning to decelerate in the March quarter. If you look at auto sales, we are seeing a similar kind of deceleration. If you see the uh, companies like Pantaloon, they are also seeing significant deceleration in the revenue growth. So consumption is beginning to decelerate. And the reason is that at some point of time, the job creation and not enough income growth on the ground for households is also showing up on uh, consumption growth. But 
I would say that in some ways, uh, in a perverse way, it would be from a macro perspective good to see a decline in consumption growth rate because we need to build savings mm -hmm. so that we can ensure that there is a decline in cost of capital which allows then investment cycle recovery. Right now that uh, high consumption growth is coming out of government's high deficit which we don't think is sustainable. So ideally consumption growth should decelerate even faster and if the government gets going in terms of policy action, like for example if you do an aggressive diesel price hike or a, a LPG price hike, it will hurt consumption mm -hmm. but it will help us build the savings for rise in investment. My final set of questions on uh, a few risk factors. Hard landing in China, exit of Greece, oil shoots up again, um, US again slips into a recession. Which of these things do you think will have the worst consequence? Well, I think that's a hard one. Uh, um if uh, all of these happen at the same time, of course, uh, the worst is the number we one. Be sitting here, that. Yeah, probably not, uh, for good or bad reasons. But uh, but in terms of the probability of all these happening, I would assign a very low probability for hard lending for China. Uh, the reason is exactly what Chad and I just argued, which is uh, there is more policy room in China from a monetary, fiscal, and also investment perspective. After all, we're still building to uh, to complete the urbanization in another. 10 to 15 years, and we're still trying to do more industrial industrial relocation away from the coastal area, more towards the middle and western part of China, and we're also doing the industrial upgrades. So there is still a lot of room for us to invest at the moment, and therefore to help cap the downside risk for hard lending. But uh, given the complicatedness of the uh, of the political situation this year, um, there is a potential risk that we may see some delay in policy uh, policy action. So that that might be uh, you know, creating more of a risk than usual for, for China's ha delivering a lower than expected growth in the near future. But we still are pretty confident that by Q Q3 and Q4, we'll see very much a policy-induced and investment-driven growth rebound. Jaitan, is the current situation in India cyclical or structural? Because there are many who are beginning to question the structural story itself. Which, which camp are you in? I think it's deep cyclical problem, it's not a structural problem. Structural problem happens when you um, have a demographic issue, when you have your potential growth underlying determined by your demographic slipping. Uh, in India we don't have that. So I would call this as a deeper cyclical problem. Maybe the duration of this cycle at the bottom also could be longer than what you usually see, but I would still describe it as a cyclical problem. But you're bearish India right now? From a cyclical perspective, yes, yeah. Okay, on that note, thank you very much, both of you, for joining us and speaking to us here on Bloomberg QT. Thank you. Thank you.